So today we're beginning a four-part sermon series entitled Generosity. I love this word, generosity. You know what it means? Webster's Dictionary defines a generosity as the act or the willingness to give to others. We all love to be on the receiving end of someone being generous to us. We love it when we receive a card that we weren't expecting from a friend that tells us how much they love and appreciate us. We love it when we've been sick and someone comes by and, and brings us food. It's an act that they did all on their own. We love it when we're at, um, we're at someone at our work and maybe a coworker says, you know what, I'm gonna buy you lunch today. We all love it when people go out of their way to be generous to us. Several weeks ago, I was at CVS Pharmacy and I was getting some stuff for our family. And when I was there, about four people ahead of us at the cashier lane was this man who was purchasing some medication for his wife. He was there and the cashier told him, sir, the bill is going to be $150 for his medication. The man turned stone white. He was like, that's a, that's a lot of money. I need to go call my wife to see what we're going to do. So he went off to the side to call his wife and he got on the phone and said, honey, that, ex that bill for this medication is so expensive that all we can purchase is simply one of those. We just can't afford it. As he was talking off to the side, the person who was directly behind him in the cashier lane said to the cashier, I'll take care of it. I'll buy it. And while he was talking to his wife, figuring out who and what medication they were going to purchase, this man right behind him said, I'll buy it, and went ahead and bought his items and the items of that, of that man that could not afford the second medication. And then he walked right out. A few moments later, that man the, that came with the, that couldn't afford those two medications come up to the cashier and said, we're only going to be able to get this medication. And before he could even finish the sentence, the cashier said, don't worry, someone was very generous to you. And let me tell you, friends, we all love it when people are generous to us. But man, God loves when you're a giver and when you're generous to people. How do I know that? Open up your worship guide this morning. The worship guide is what you have on your pews this morning. And I want you to take a little pencil. I want you to write some numbers down for me, okay? Just to kind of give you a little bit of an explanation of how many times God uses certain words in the Bible. So let's just start out with the word believe. A very good word. Be several. I believe. The word believe in the Bible is just mentioned. Write this down. 272 times. The word pray is mentioned 371 times. How about the word love? That's a good word. We all should love one another. The word love is mentioned 714 times. Well, let me break it down for you. The word give in giving to others, write this number down, is mentioned 2,171 times. That's not for me to tell you how important giving is. God talks about how important giving is. And sometimes, friends, we've got to recognize that the greatest gift that we can give the people in this world is when we have the attitude, I'm going to give like that man at CBS, looking for nothing. I'm going to give generously, looking for no one ever to repay me. I want you to open up your Bibles now to page 300, sorry, 244. We're looking at 2 Corinthians. It's a powerful chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And just to kind of give you a backdrop about what this verse is about, this is not in your worship guide notes, so if you want to write down this verse, you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 12, and listen to what it is. It's about Paul talking to the people of Corinth. Now, I don't know about you, some of you may be from Corinth. Back in those days, Corinth was a very wealthy, very, very wealthy city. In fact, it was so wealthy that Paul is writing this letter, and in this particular section of the book of Corinthians, he's challenging them because they're not stepping up to where they need to step up. He's challenging them because he needs help for the people in Jerusalem, for the church in Jerusalem, 
who was under enormous persecution from the Romans, from the Jewish leadership that don't abide by, that particular, by the Christian faith. They're under enormous pressure. He's saying to the people of Corinth, you are wealthy in so many levels, and I need you. And so let's pick it up. Verse 1, it says, Our brothers, we want you to know what God's grace has accomplished in the churches in Macedonia. So Macedonia, another area in the Asia Minor area that is suffering also enormous persecution under enormous trials that they're going through. And so Paul is saying, people of Corinth, look at your brothers and sisters in Macedonia at those churches. How are they responding to the needs of the people who are in need in Jerusalem? They have been severely tested by the troubles they have gone through. But their joy was so great that, that they were extremely, what's that word? Generous in their giving, even though they are very poor. I can assure you that, that they gave as much as they could of their own free will. They weren't coerced. They simply gave on their own of having a part in the helping of God's people in Judea. It was more than we could have ever even hoped for. First, they gave themselves. They dedicated their life first and foremost to God. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then they gave, then by God's will, they gave themselves up. So now we're urging Titus. Titus was a man that was in charge of helping the people there in Corinth do the collections, help the people to know what the message needed to be about giving and being generous who began this work to continue it and to help you complete this special service of love. Listen to this. You are rich. You and me, we are rich. It may not be rich according to what you might classify or what America might tell us that rich is, but you're rich. 80% of the world's population makes less than $10 a day. 70% live without even a roof over their head. That's not 7%, that's 70%. We are rich. You are so rich in, you, in, in all that you have, in faith, in speech, and in knowledge, and in your eagerness to help all and in your love for us. And so we want you to read it with me now, and we want you to be, come on now, generous, also in this service of love. I'm not laying down any rules to you. In other words, she's not saying, I want you to do this, and if you don't give to this, then you're going to be not going to be appreciated or loved or have a plaque on your wall. I'm not doing this because I want you to do it, but by showing how eager you are to help, I'm trying to find out how real you really love us and how much you love God because you know the grace. What's the word grace? Charis. It means gift. God gave us a gift of our Lord Jesus Christ and I love this verse. And if you want to write it, put it on your chalkboard, put it on a refrigerator. But listen to this, because this sums it up all in a very short statement. Jesus Christ was rich, but he made himself poor for me and you in order to make you rich by means of his poverty. And a lot of churches, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of priests and pastors get this all wrong. Because they think that just because you have faith in Jesus that you need to, you're going to be rich. No. -uh. He's saying Jesus Christ had it all. He's God. He lost everything. He became a poor servant. Died on the cross to save you so that you could be rich, not in this world, because we ain't about this world, but I want you to be rich in the kingdom of heaven. And I want that to get on the inside of you. Don't put your faith in this world. It will disappoint you. He's saying, I want you to be rich because you're rich, but more importantly, because God was so rich that he gave his only son to you. So that you, because you were poor, you were sold into slavery, you could be rich in the kingdom to come. And I'll close it out with this last thing. In order to make you rich by means of his poverty. So what does that mean for us? Let me give it to you in just four points, and it's in your worship guide, I would encourage you. We put this, we spend a lot of time on this every single week. Open it up, and just, if you want to take notes, you can, but there are Bible verses associated to each one of these sections. Take it home and read it on your own. Don't just believe whatever I'm telling you. Listen to what's being said by God and the inspired Word of God. But let's just start with the very first one. Give joyfully. You know, the Bible says the word cheerful. It is more, it is 
when we are called to be cheerful in our giving. You know what the word cheerful is in Greek? Y'all ready for it? Ilaron. You know what the word, another word that comes from the word ilaron is? Hilarious. God wants that when we give to people, man, it drives, it makes us so happy. It's so hilarious that we, not in a condescending way, but we can give to people. And when we give, don't give with a sad face. Don't give to this church. Listen up with a sad face. Well, I got to give to the community. Well, I got to go help that person who's in need. No, don't do that. You are giving because God says he loves a cheerful, a hilarious giver. Another, another area says it is more blessed to give than receive. You know what the word blessed is in Greek? Makari. You know what the word makari is in English? Happy. It is happiness that we should have that when we give. When you give anything to anyone, whether it be an organization, whether it be to another person, man, give it out of happiness. Give joyfully. Second thing, take this notes down. Give selflessly. I love when we read in our liturgy book and when we follow this, and we even hear it also at football games and everything, and they hear this phrase, John 3, 16, and we hear it all the time, but I just want to break it down for you a little bit. God so what? Gave. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. The verb, if you want to know one verb to know in the Bible, it's the word give. God is always a giving God. He gave us not a son, but his only son. He gave first. Today when you leave here this morning, we have a little gift for you, and I just hope that you'll take it. You don't have to, but if you want to, but it's a little bracelet. And on this bracelet, all it says is, God first. And it just to remind you that whenever you're doing anything, whether it be dealing with stresses or worries or anxieties that you might have, or whether it is just giving generously, that you say to yourself, God, you gave first. And I think to myself, look at all the selfless people throughout the Bible and in our own life that give selflessly all the time. What if the Virgin Mary, the Panagia, never said, you know what? I don't believe in virgin births. This ain't for me. What if David said, giants? Are you kidding me? I'm not going to go out there and slay some giant. What if Paul said, you know what? I got to write a letter? What are you talking about? Let's break it down even closer to home. What if a hundred years ago, our foremothers and forefathers never wanted to plant a church? Hello? Would we be here? People gave selflessly. And God wants you and me, when we're giving generously to people, that we're giving selflessly. Third one, I want you to give, and when you give, I want you to give willingly. Don't give because you've got to, or that you're being coerced to. That Bible verse will tell you all about it. Even in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 12, that same section we were in, it says, for if the willingness is there, then God will look at that gift with acceptance. God doesn't want you to give because you got to. He wants you to say, I want to give to you, God, and I want to honor you, and I want to help that person that's four people up from me at the cashier line. I, will, I want to help out this church, or I want to do whatever it is. I want to do it, but I want to do it because I get to. And our attitude in this world, friends, is so much about what I got to do. And if you turn it around, and if you think to yourself, God gave me the first gift. Everything I have is because of him. Not because you got to, but because you get to. And let's close it out with this last one. I want you to give thankfully. I love, I love, love this verse from the book of Psalms. It says, what shall I return to the Lord for all the goodness he's given to me? Do me a favor. Close your eyes for a second. I'm going to close mine too. Just close it. I want you to think about everything that God has given you for a moment. Think about the person who's right next to you right now. Think about your best friend. Who's your best friend right now? 
Who right now, think about your wife or your husband. Think about them. Or how about your children? Or how about think about this church and what it means to you? Think about it. Hone in. Think about your job, your car, your health, your breath that you can breathe. Now open up your eyes. When we got a lot to be thankful for, and when we give to people, you want to have the attitude that, God, I'm going to give to this person that's in need. Why? Because you gave to me first. And I'm not going to give because I, get, I got to because I get to. I'm going to close it out with this statement. On November 15, 1970, in the small city of Huntington, West Virginia, tragedy would strike that would change the life of that, history, that city forever. Members of the Marshall College football team were on that plane ride. Many of their boosters and coaches, medical staff, they were all on that plane that went down on November 15th, 1970, almost 45 years ago. It devastated that city. Many of the people, if you read their quotes about the news at that time, they will tell you that it was just like the assassination of John F. Kennedy. They knew where they were and what they were doing when that plane went down, killing all those people on board. And it's interesting that after the death of all of these people on that plane ride, that they needed something to bring together that city and to bring together that college. And so they had this very simple but yet powerful mantra that goes like this. We are Marshall. We are Marshall. So I want you all to do something with me. We're going to do a little bit of an exercise that is going to see your participation and your involvement. I'm going to say we are, and then I want you to say we are. And then I'm going to tell you who we are. All right? You all ready to do this? You want to know what's going to happen in church this morning? Never know. Keep it always in an unpredictable way. All right, ready? Here we go. We are, we are. God's eyes. We are God's feet. We are God's ears. We are we are God's arms. We are St. John the Divine. And God is asking you and me to give, and when we give, man, give it generously. Give, friends, joyfully. Give selflessly. Give willingly and give thankfully because God gave you and me first. He gave us a whole new life. And if you want to know what moves the heart of Jesus Christ, it is when we are going out, giving generously to people, looking for absolutely nothing in return. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.